Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this fine day? Let's get into another lesson here. Let's finish up this uh, chapter here at 34, uh, this SAG chapter in the history of Jacob's family. But with a little twist at the end, uh, I've been talking about that, uh, I mentioned the uh, that passage in Deuteronomy about those two hills. And I love the tie-in to this story. Uh, and so we'll take a look at that at the end of this uh, passage here. Let's start with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, so much for this uh, time we get to look at your word and for all the things that you've done to uh, uh, help us to understand your word. We give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let's dig right in. Let's get some verses up here. And for now, I'll put the map up. Actually, no, maybe I will put the uh, the mountains up. So we're going to be talking about this area. I'll just go with the map so that we can uh, talk about this at the end. There's a map over here in uh, Shikam, as you remember. And it's got quite an interesting history. Now that I've done a little bit more research uh, and how it ties in with the blessings and the curses done on uh, Mount Gizarim uh, and Mount Ebel. So we'll put that at the end as a, as a uh, capstone for this, this part of the story. So we left off at verse 19. And so we're going to, uh, and we're going to continue on here. And remember that uh, Jacob had made this deal. And Jacob, uh, actually his two sons, uh, Simeon and Levi, had made this deal with uh, uh, Hamor and Shechem uh, about how they were going to get circumcised. So these two gentlemen are now going to go back to the city and convince all the males in the city to get circumcised and try to convince them of this. But just like we've seen many times in the past, uh, most business in most cities in that time frame was done at the gates of the city. And then this one's no different. So let's take a look here, we'll read. And Heber and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of the city and communed with the men of the city, saying, like I said, I mentioned, uh, we see that, uh, I mentioned that the gates are well known and we, we've we seen quite a few of them. And Ruth 4.1, we saw that uh, Boaz went up to the gate and sat there and down and beheld the kinsmen of whom Boaz spake came up by, unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sit down. So that was Boaz and uh, he was getting ready to make the deal for uh, uh, Ruth. Also in Job 29.7, uh, Job himself was a member of the uh, council of the city and went up to the city gates. When I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seal in the street, my seat in the street. Proverbs 31, 32, 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Uh, this here is some, uh, sounds like a woman is making, as proud of her husband that he is a part of the uh, city government in Proverbs there. So we can see it's a well-known place for conducting business. We know that uh, Haman and uh, she Shechem here are gonna go try to convince the city to get circumcised. Moving on here in verse 21, the men are peaceable with us, therefore let them, they're talking about Jacob and his, and his uh, sons, Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade therein, <clears throat> for the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. <clears throat> well, of course, we already know how God feels about this. <clears throat> We're going to review that here in a minute. But uh, <clears throat> God is not happy that Jacob, uh, would, if Jacob ever fell th uh, followed through with this, That would be a real, uh, real problem with uh, God because God needs to keep Jacob's sons pure to the Jewish nation. They're going to become the Jewish nation. So it can't be intermingling with uh, Canaanites. 
Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us, to be one people, in other words, uh, for them to, to be willing to be part of our community, if every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them and they will dwell with us. So they're thinking that if they, if they go in for this, then they're going to be able to get uh, uh, control of, the, of everything that they own also at some point. If they intermarry, they become family and uh, henceforth get to share in all the riches of uh, Jacob's family. So will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? The father and son, Hamar and Shechem, have to convince the men of their community to receive this painful and possibly dangerous procedure for circumcision. Uh, they convinced them that it was worth it because they could then take their daughters to us as wives and take their livestock, property, and every animal of theirs. The potential gain of wealth was worth it. Because when they would give their daughters, remember I mentioned before, how that uh, daughters in this culture were considered almost like property. So that when they would want, say that uh, the 12 sons would want to be able to marry uh, women in their city, then they would have to have diary, dowries, which would require them to get uh, cattle and, and, and all that kind of stuff from, uh, from the uh, sons of Jacob. So, I, so the, the, the gears are turning as to how... And Hamer and uh, Shikam use this as a, their advantage to try to convince the city. Moving on. Verse 24. And unto Hamar and unto Shikam, his son, hearkened all that they went out of the gate of the city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of the city. So every male got circumcised. They convinced them. The men of Shikam agreed and all received the painful or potentially dangerous operation of circumcision. And then... Uh, Probably about two to three days later, when they were, in, they were in full pain from this from this procedure, when Sim, uh, Simeon and Levi go in and actually kill everyone except the women and children, and that's what we're going to see next. That was that was their plan all along. Verse twenty-five. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. That was not only a brutal, deceptive act, but it also disregarded God's covenant of circumcision. They used that to their advantage. That's God's covenant. Surely will this clever act of violent deception, Simeon and Levi showed themselves to be the children of Jacob from a bitter, competitive home environment. Jacob did ultimately have a, a not-so-nice prophecy upon his death. Uh, let me just fast forward to their death. When, uh, when Jacob was talking to the two of them upon his death about how their lives are going to be, he mentions this. So Jacob never forgot. And that's in Genesis 49, 5 and 6. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into the, thy secret until I assembly mine honor, but not thy united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a well. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So there's a prophecy about God that Jacob told him that God is going to do, and he did. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So a couple of comments by some uh, other theologians, a man by the name of Kidner uh, said, in pain, crudely performed circumcision could be quite incapacitating, particularly after two or three days. Uh, they basically did it with a sharp uh, stone of some sort, and it was not a pain. Uh, and also Barnhouse mentions, that's another theologian, says the boldness with which they executed their foul plan shows the hardness of their hearts. So it came boldly. It was a bold plan to massacre an entire community of men under the cover of their acceptance of the demand to be circumcised. It was bold in the cause of their evil. That was, uh, in our day and age, that would be called uh, pretty much uh, first degree murder because they planned it ahead of time and they lied in wait. 
So they'd probably be facing the uh, electric chair or the uh, or some other form of uh, 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 death uh, by the hand of the uh, magistrates. In this particular time frame, uh, basically God's going to take care of them. But it's interesting how, they, how he takes care of them. They both get scattered, but not quite like you think. But we're going to get to that at the end. Moving on, verses 26 through 29. Here we're going to talk about uh, what happens next. And they slew Hamer and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of the Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that, that which is in the city, that was, which was in the field. So they stole all their property and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took their captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. They killed Hamar. Uh, we, and we already saw that uh, mentioned though. We mentioned uh, again, back to that verse in Genesis 49, five and six. And Shechem his son with the edge of the sword there was no sparing of the sword, even relatively good men like Shechem. And I feel bad for Shechem uh, and his and all the men because they uh, uh, basically they uh, uh, they were just trying to. Uh, to them, this wasn't. A, they, they didn't do anything evil. Uh, I think Shechem, uh, based on the way he was raised, uh, this was a normal way of conducting things. Uh, he met, uh, he met Dinah. They, they kind of liked each other. It does say raped, but in whose eyes? Uh, I'm not sure that Shechem thought that she that he had raped her in his eyes. Here we have a young teenager, uh, probably uh, really was attracted to Shechem, possibly. It doesn't really say. It seemed like she might have been willing uh, to be there because when they went to go kill all the men, uh, she was actually in the in the castle with uh, Shechem. So I get the impression it was just a teenager, uh, full of hormones, uh, off in an adventure, and really didn't uh, consider much about what she had learned from her father in the years past. And when it comes to Shechem himself, I'm not sure that he was uh, guilty of anything really, according to the way he was raised. These are just speculations on my part. But in, in Genesis 34, 19, we saw, and the young man deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. But he was willing to be circumcised, uh, no problem at all, in order to, uh, to get Dinah's hand. So he was, uh, he was more honorable, even according to what we read here, than the rest of the, uh, uh, than his father was. The sons of Jacob justified their murder and theft by saying their sister and family had been dishonored, but the, the punishment was pretty excessive. And they plundered the city. Look at a verse in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, uh, which while some coveted after they had erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, they took their ship and their oxen and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field and all their wealth. The sons of Jacob completely plundered the city of Shechem, including uh, surviving women and children as slaves. By making some amends for their sister's defilement with a disastrous treachery, they slay the whole of the Shechemites and so bring the guilt of the murder upon a family which ought to have been holiness under the Lord. That was uh, Charles Spurgeon that said that. So moving on here to verse 30 and 31. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Pisiites. And I, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, should, we, should uh, he, de he deal with our sister as with a harlot? Uh, so that's the two sons talking. Uh, but that, uh, again, this is it's a sad affair. Yes, there was, there was errors made on both sides, but uh, I think that the ultimate problem was that, uh, and the uh, could be almost stretched back to the way, uh, the typical way the household ran 
when you look at the fact that Jacob had his favorites and he had his non-favorites and uh, and he let it know, be known So you have me. Uh, you have me troubled. Me make me obnoxious. It's it, in response to the terrible massacre and plundering of Shechem. Jacob seemed uh, to only be concerned with himself and the danger of retribution, retribution against his small family, I and few in number. There was no concern for right and wrong, for God's righteousness, or for death and plunder of the innocent. This is Jacob, not Israel, in action. Uh, and Guzik. Uh, that was a comment by Guzik. All was out of order and threatened to become even worse. Even the heathen outside began to smell ill savor of Jacob's disorganized family. And the one alternative was mend or end. That was something that Charles Spurgeon said. And uh, quote Barnhouse, uh, Jacob, you brought that trouble on yourself. You passed your own deceitful nature into your boys. You set them a con constant example of guile. They heard you lie to Esau at Penal and, and start northwest after he went southeast. They saw you interest in the fat pastures when you pitched your tent in Shechem. You said nothing when Dinah was violated. Talk to God about your own sin before talking to these boys about theirs. That was Barnhouse that uh, commented about this story. Should he treat our sister like a harlot? <laughs> And this was Simeon and Levi's only reply. They were correct that their sister Dinah had been abused and, and treated terribly, yet none of the, uh, that justified the outrageous evils of mass murder, enslaving women and children, and theft through plunder. So when Jacob was about to die, he prophesied over each of his 12 sons. This is what we, he said about Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter thy counsel, let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed by their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So he saw Simeon and Levi for who they were, but he rebuked them far too late. So that did happen. Uh, the tribe of Simeon, because of their lack of faithfulness, was effectively dissolved as a tribe. And the tribe of Simeon was absorbed into the tribal area of Judah. Uh, they stopped becoming uh, like identified as a tribe. And then the tribe of Levi was also scattered. But because of the faithfulness of this tribe during the rebellion in the golden calf episode, well, let's take a look, brief look at that. No, they basically repented of themselves as a as a uh, tribe in, in doing this. In Genesis 49, 5 through 7, Simeon and Levi are brother. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Oh, this is the, oh, I, I meant to draw it. Exodus, Exodus 32, 26 through 28. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. This was after that incident of the uh, when Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments, and that they were worshiping an idol. And, and this was the punishment uh, phase here we're reading about. And Levi stood up for God's side, and they didn't worship that golden idol. And the children of Edom Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. But the particular, this particular tribe being scattered all over Israel as the ones that took care of the temple uh, was actually a blessing uh, throughout the whole nation of Israel. So both were scattered, but one as a blessing and the other as a curse. So that's where this next part comes in. I'm going to show you that uh, is really neat. So the lesson for this, the whole story is not condoned by God at all. And as Paul reminds us, let me just finish this up part up. It's it's up to God to handle these kind of things that uh, we don't we don't take hands in, uh, vengeance into our own hands. Now, it's not to say we can't defend ourselves. Of course we can. And there are times when we may have to hurt another person, particularly if we're being attacked. 
But to actually lie in wait and actually go after somebody in vengeance is not our place. It's supposed to lead that to God. And, and John uh, Paul reminds us here in Romans 12, 19 through 21, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If they thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so, uh, so at the end of this sad day, I can see uh, God had this story to also teach future generations as a memorial. Uh, this place with a commandment right here in between Mount Gazim on the left and Mount Ebo on the right. So now I'll bring up the pictures. I got a different picture here and let me get my bigger cursor. So this area in the bottom here, this is Shikam right here. This is a natural amphitheater right in through here. Uh, you can see by, by the way it's described. This is Mount, uh, uh, Mount uh, Gerzazim is over here on the left and that's the Blessing Mountain. And then this mountain over here is Mount Ebal is on the right. And, and when, then, and when uh, uh, Moses was directed the children of Israel, when they took over the land, that once a year, everybody gathered in this area and, would, and they would announce from the top of the mountains the blessings and the curses. And that's where Deuteronomy 27, 11 through 26 comes into play. And it's starting right here. So let's just read through this. It's uh, all about De Deuteronomy 27, 11 through 26. And what they would do is Moses charged the people that the same, uh, the same day saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi, and Judea and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. Notice Levi is on the blessing side. Simeon and Levi. Verse 13. And thou shalt stand upon Mount Ebal to the to curses, Reuben, Gad, and Asher, and Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And to the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. And all the people say, Amen. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be them that make the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. And cursed be he that per perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth the father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be that he lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he, he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be that he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. And cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that com uh, confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. But basically, they got on top of this mountain once a year, and they, and they listed all these to remind people. And it's interesting the place they chose, because this is the place that that atrocity happened between Simeon and Levi. Uh, and I got a couple of other pictures here. Is one a little bit closer. 
And that little tiny little red circle, that's exactly where that uh, 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 the monument uh, that shows the old land of uh, Shikam. Uh, this whole area is inhabited now. Uh, and actually, from what I understand, if you try to visit there now, it's actually mostly Muslim now. But something I'm sure that the Lord is going to take back control of uh, after the, during the Millennium Kingdom. And here's another angle of that picture. I think I showed you this one uh, yesterday, showing the two mountains. So basically all the people would stand here and somebody would be up on the mountains talking about the, the, the blessings and the curses. And if I understand that they have discovered a monument, an altar up on top here, that they've uh, been able to get a few pieces of it. And when they analyze it, does it, look, it looks like it does have the all the, those curses that I mentioned listed on it. They found enough of it to say something about curses, curses, curses. Uh, and so they believe that this, that, that this particular story confirms with archaeology of this story. Uh, I thought that was really neat to hear. Remember I was telling you too about the uh, tr uh, trying to get across. Let me show you this picture first. Trying to get across how deep uh, the, uh, the Jordan River is. And I remember when I was talking about the fact that uh, they were over on this side in the, in the Jordan area, or Ammon, and they had to cross over uh, near Jericho and to get back over to the other side. You can see how deep it is. And the Dead Sea is actually about 1,300 feet below sea level. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. So let's get a really nice cutoff, kind of show you how low that river is. And uh, the difference between Jerusalem and the river is, uh, well, Jerusalem is 2,540 feet above sea level. So you're talking 3,000, almost 4,000 feet difference between sea level and Jerusalem. And going back to the other picture, this shows it from a side view. But there's Mount Ebo and Mount Gerzidim. Uh, so it's not very far from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is over here. And you can see the river actually flows down. Uh, so uh, here's, here's the Sea of Galilee, where the disciples spent a lot of their time. And here's Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is where we uh, the, remember our Luke study uh, is when we talked about the uh, uh, that period of time that Jesus took the disciples up to that place where uh, he had to tell uh, it was up in this general area, uh, Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, as where he uh, was supposedly this cave. They say that that Satan, uh, that Satan dwells there, and remember that was the time that Jesus told uh, told uh, Simon, uh, Simon was being tested by Satan, and you remember Jesus kind of spoke up to him and said that uh, uh, Satan get behind me, uh, you're an abomination to me, and uh, that happened up uh, in this end of the uh, uh, Jordan River. It gives you a really good contrast to how much it flows downhill. Because uh, Sea of Galilee is about 690 feet below sea level. And the Dead Sea is about 1,300 feet below sea level. A very mountainous area. <laughs> so that is my lesson for today. And that ends this chapter. And it, uh, and basically, I guess I, th I think it's a good, good thing to remember that uh, uh, to leave things in the Lord's hand when it comes to this. I think the other thing that uh, we're taught here too, and I was going to mention, and I got a few more minutes, so I'll mention it now, is that I see from this story too that it's so important to do things God's way. And God always intended it for to be one man and one woman uh, for life uh, when it comes to marriage. And that uh, uh, this story here just kind of confirms that when you start getting uh, a family that's uh, built upon, uh, in this case, he had four wives. And I think that's why the Lord really designed it to be one man and one woman. Uh, and I just started to uh, mention a, two, a few verses in that area talking about that. And it starts all the way back in Genesis 2.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And I'm not saying there's never, never a reason to divorce, uh, but that, uh, that's not God's perfect plan. And it's definitely not a reason to have multiple wives at the same time. Uh, also, Matthew, Jesus talking about Matthew 19, 4 through 6. And he answered and said to them, 
Have you not read that he which, which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and, they, and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore thou art no more twain but one flesh. But therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And uh, that's Jesus. And then Paul comments about it in 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. One, one each, that's it. Let the husband render unto, unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath no power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath no power over his body, but the wife. So, so I think those are some great things to remember. Uh, and I can see that this family, I'm starting to see more and more how the uh, the interactions of the family itself and the, the dynamics of this particular family are not uh, counter, are counterproductive to the proper order that God had designed. And we're going to see more of this as we head more into the uh, next phase, uh, which is uh, when Jacob... Uh, comes up uh, in the ranks and he is favored over the rest of the boys and there becomes a lot of jealousy in the family and so we'll be heading in that direction next I think it actually starts in chapter 35 and on and it goes right through to the end of the uh, book uh, end of Genesis so we'll be studying that stuff next so let's end with a prayer Oh Lord, thank you, thank you so much for your guidance in all matters, and that uh, and that your your way is the perfect way, and that uh, uh, to try to uh, see how many times I, you know, how many mistakes I've made in my past, and that I I praise you and thank you for the the blessings you bestow upon us, anyways, and even though we don't deserve them, uh, we give you praise and thanks for your your love and your caring for us, and you continue to help us through our. Uh, our misfortunes and our sins of, uh, of uh, things that we uh, seem to continue to do to displease you. But thank you so much for the forgiveness you give us every day. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay, I will talk to you guys again tomorrow. And we'll continue on this interesting time frame of learning about Jacob and his 12 sons. <laughs>